Good morning. Good morning and welcome. My name is Catherine Murray. I love the energy. I love the energy in the room. I'm going to welcome you all to this, our final uh, lecture series with the Fast Speakers, Fast Canada 150 Speaker Series. Please do come in and make yourself comfortable. Thank you very much. Uh, we're delighted to be ending our uh, summer series on a comic note with our two illustrious speakers. I'm interested in, in introducing you to Diana, uh, Diana Solomon and Sean Zwagerman from the Department of English, both well suited to actually review for us today 150 years of Canadian women's comedy with a great title. I've also been privileged to hear the two of them do a drive run at the Burnaby Festival of Learning at the Burnaby Public Library and it was very well received so I'm sure it's going to uh, actually ripen over the ensuing weeks. Let me let me say that it's um, uh, there could be no others more uh, experienced in this subject matter. Diana specializes in restoration in 18th century British literature. Many of you are here from English, I know, so this is probably no surprise. Her research interests include theater studies, comedy, women's writers, and print culture. She has published a book, Prologues and Epilogues to Restoration Theater, Gender and Comedy, Performance and Print in 2013. And with four colleagues from the SFU English Department, she edited Women and Comedy, History, Theory and Practice, published in paperback in 2016. And she's currently working on a book length pro project, again about comedy and repetition in restoration in 18th century theater. Sean Zwagerman is similarly very well equipped with an interest in rhetoric and writing and compositional relationship among the word self and the world. Uh, he uh, is one of the co-editors of Women and uh, Comedy, History, Theory and Practice uh, and also has a forthcoming work including contributions to a series of essays on the rhetoric of oil and a collection on transgressive women's humor. And I'll be interested in hearing more about that. Uh, and uh, finally, he's author of Wits End, Women's Humor as a Rhetorical and Performative Strategy 2010. The English department is an extraordinary assortment of people, an assembly of talent, I must say, amongst the top in Canada. You're very lucky to have them here to talk to you. We also have Taylor Morfitt, doctoral student working with Sean, who is going to have the delightful opportunity to cross-examine her senior supervisor <laughs> in retribution and anticipation of her own successful defense. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to suggest the format for today is about 20 minutes or 25 minutes thereabouts for the presentation. We then will invite Taylor up to have a question and answer and then just an informal um, set of comments from you. Please do stay with us because we will be having pizza and an informal conversation thereafter as well. Uh, just before uh, Canada Day weekend, I think it's really important to recall not only Canada's many triumphs as a, 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 as a nation, but its many failures, as our Aboriginal Reconciliation Council will remind us, but also its enormous uh, emerging and evolving canon of comedy and humor and perhaps you can take away some insight for your own uh, weekend uh, festivities. Thank you. Thank you Catherine for your wonderful introduction and for having us here today. As you've just heard, the two of us specialize in very different subjects. I study 18th century literature and theater. Sean studies composition and rhetoric, but we share a common interest in humor studies. Now that doesn't mean we just sit around and tell each other stupid jokes, although there is a fair amount of that. Rather, our academic work involves taking comedy seriously as a subject of inquiry. Yes, we take the study of comedy seriously, but the very fact that we have to say that, or worry that we have to say that, points to one of the problems facing comedy studies. We lay the blame at Aristotle's doorstep. In the Poetics, he ranks tragedy as a more noble pursuit than comedy, and to add insult to injury, his discussion of tragedy has survived 
but his discussion of comedy, if it even existed, has not. As a result, ever since Aristotle, scholars have labored under the legacy that comedy is inferior to tragedy. Tragedy is serious and noble and worthy of study, while comedy is supposedly none of those things. If historically and institutionally, comedy is the lesser counterpart to tragedy, and if in patriarchal cultures, women are the lesser counterpart to men, then studying women's comedy is really <laughs> trivial. Perhaps that's why so many books about comedy and women's comedy have titles like A Very Serious Thing, <laughs> Women's Humor and American Culture. Comedy scholars like us think we have to preempt the expected response that what we're writing about is frivolous. But in fact, in studying comedy, we find ourselves in the company of some seriously important people. In De Oratore, Cicero writes about the use of humor in public oratory as a way to connect with the audience by demonstrating one's wit. Cicero recognizes that a spontaneous and clever sense of humor is taken as a sign of intelligence. A couple of thousand years later, Freud wrote a very influential book called Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious, in which he argues that joke telling is often motivated by aggression or frustrated sexuality. You're all shocked. <laughs> Most useful for this talk is Freud's description of a triangular dynamic wherein a man is sexually attracted to a woman but finds his desires either rejected by the woman or blocked in that moment by social norms. It's generally not okay, for instance, for a man at a restaurant to tear the waitress's clothes off and assault her. So the man circumvents these frustrations to his libido by bringing another man into the scene. Man number one then tells a sexual joke to man number two in front of the woman, thereby symbolically stripping her naked in the presence and for the pleasure of the two men. Alongside the idea that comedy is a poor substitute for tragedy, Freud is suggesting that it's a poor substitute for sex. As profoundly different as these works are, and whether or not we buy the particulars of Freud's theory, they have, for our purposes, one notable feature in common. Cicero assumes, and Freud states outright, that the person using humor is male. Freud does see a role for women in joking exchanges, but unfortunately, it's always the same role. Women are the butt of men's jokes. And times haven't changed all that much since Freud. The majority of today's stand-up comedians in North America are still male, and all but the top female comedians earn less than males. Why does this state of affairs still exist? One primary reason is the abiding myth that women aren't funny. Every few years in North America, a male writer pens an article proclaiming that women don't have a sense of humor. And then there is lots of heated discussion and rebuttals and magazines sold, and the man's career prospects soar. In the most infamous attack of our young century, Christopher Hitchens published in a 2007 issue of Vanity Fair a magazine an article, Why Women Aren't Funny. He offered a multitude of unsustained and unsustainable claims, with the primary one being that women don't need to be funny because comedy is the way that men attract women, whereas women don't need to do anything to attract men besides sit there and look pretty. <laughs> Accordingly, women who are funny are, according to Hitchens, hefty or dikey or Jewish, <laughs> categories apparently outside of Hitchens' heterosexist world. Hitchens begins his article, Why are women who have the whole male world at their mercy not funny? Please do not pretend not to know what I am talking about. <laughs> As scholars of comedy, we don't have to pretend. We really do not know what he is talking about. <laughs> 
but we do know that this myth continues to be perpetuated and that as a result, women's humor is less likely to be recognized and appreciated. Another issue facing female comic practitioners is the disassociation of aggression with femininity. Comedy that arises as a response to oppression or struggle or suffering, or even to just the realities of day-to-day -day existence, may have an angry, aggressive edge. But if an enduring image of ideal womanhood holds a woman to be sincerous, sincere, earnest, and sober, that is, to not have a sense of humor, it also expects her to not be angry or aggressive. It is no coincidence that many of the most popular and famous female comedians, from Lucille Ball to Ellen DeGeneres, come across as non-threatening and lovable. There are exceptions, of course, like Joan Rivers and Margaret Cho, but within the history of women comedians, they have indeed been the exceptions. Just as female joke tellers are less likely to garner a laugh from a joke, so are they less likely to be recognized for achievements in the field of comedy. Compounding the problem is Aristotle's curse. Awards for comic writing are fewer and tend to be of more recent vintage, and it's rare that writing with a comic bent gets nominated for more comprehensive mainstream prizes, such as the Man Booker or the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Within the comedy prizes, many fewer women are nominated, and the female nominees are much less likely to win. In the US, for example, the James Thurber Prize is only 20 years old and has only been awarded regularly since 2004. During this time, only one woman has won the prize as opposed to 15 men, and only 13 women have been nominated as opposed to 38 men. In the UK, the Bollinger Everyman Woodhouse Pride for, Prize for Literary Humor founded in 2000, only one woman has won as compared to 15 men, and only one third of the nominees have been female. Compared to the US and the UK, Canada is notable for hosting the longest running literary comedy prize, and for actually giving a substantial cash award to the winner, as opposed to the UK's Woodhouse Prize, which names a pig after the winning novel. <laughs> the founding of the Stephen Laycock Memorial Medal, Leacock Memorial Medal for Humor in 1946, speaks to the country's long-running support of homegrown humor. Yet after women won the prize three times during its first eight years, no women won the prize for the following 22 years until Sandra Gottlieb in 1979, and then another 17 years would go by in between the next two female winners, Marsha Bolton in 1996 and Cassie Stocks in 2013. Since Susan Juby won in 2016, we can hope that the Leacock Awards have picked up the pace. But our purpose behind citing these awards is, we hope, clear. That female comedians and comic writers are far less recognized for their craft than are males. Canadian comedy itself, argues Margaret Atwood, in the essay, What's So Funny? Notes on Canadian Humor, is distinct from American and British humor and is bound up in a particularly Canadian paradox involving a particularly Canadian trait, provinciality. The paradigmatic scene of Canadian humor, according to Atwood, would be a newfie who has made it out, has, say, moved to Toronto telling jokes about backwards newfies to other newly urbanized recovering newfies. <laughs> I am not like them, the joke teller thinks. I am not provincial, I am cosmopolitan. But, Atwood writes, as provinciality is seen as something irrevocably connected with being Canadian, the audience can renounce its provinciality only by disavowing its Canadianism as well. 
To laugh at Canadian provincialism, then, is to recognize the provincial in oneself. In the essay, Canadian Humor and National Culture, Beverly Rasperich identifies a widely held tenet of national identity, which identifies a Canadian national character based on northernness. But the concept of a national character is now considered as dubious here as it is in the US. The great white north isn't all white, and plenty of contemporary Canadian humor functions precisely through that recognition. Aaron Mukherjee describes as a parody of Canadian patriotism the First Nations revision of O Canada from our home and native land to our stolen native land. But even if we now feel uncertain about answering the question, what is a Canadian? We're still quite sure about one thing that Canadians are not. They're not Americans. If Canadian humor, as Atwood and others claim, is marked by a comedic, comedic attitude of modesty and inferiority, we're not as rich or powerful as Americans, but we're friendlier and more polite. It is also marked by laughter at the expense of Americans, complete ignorance of anything not having to do with themselves, including anything about Canada, its history, its political system, its culture, even its location, somewhere north of Buffalo. <laughs> we now want to discuss the two examples of Canadian women's comedy alluded to in our title. Fans of L.M. Montgomery will recognize the broken slates as referring to Anne of Green Gables, to the scene where Anne goes to school for the first time. What is your name? Anne Shirley. Anne spelt with an E. We pride ourselves in our scholastic record. <laughs> and we hope that you will strive to meet our standards. Oh, I'm sure I will, Mr. Phillips. I've taught children younger than myself to read before, and both my parents were teachers. I'm positive we'll have a lot in common. You will share a seat with Diana Barry. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Diana Berry is my bosom friend. Please take your seat and read your lesson. I must work with my queen student now. All right, class, take out your notebooks, memorize the dictation from yesterday. Sir, I, I was teasing her. Stand at the blackboard for the rest of the day. I will not tolerate this kind of vindictive temperament in my class. Anne Shirley has a very bad temper. And she will learn to control it. You will write this 100 times before leaving today. famous scene, Anne has just arrived and is being introduced to the class. She is eager and earnest, a good student and a good girl. It's no surprise then that she is almost immediately bullied by the boys. Recalling Freud's association of jokes with frustrated libido, the scene from Anne of Green Gables is not without sexual energy. The teacher moves to the back of the classroom to work with his queen student. 
kneeling intimately beside her while Anne and her friend Diana giggle about it. The boys, meanwhile, seem to know that their interest in girls is physical, but they're too young and clueless to know what kind of physical. So after one boy thrusts his little mouse into Anne's face, what would Freud say about that? <laughs> Another, Gilbert, calls her carrots and gives one of her red braids a good yank. So far, so good for Anne playing Freud's traditional female role as the butt of male aggression within the joking triangle, but only for a moment. Anne immediately and aggressively defies this role. She leaps to her feet, shouts, how dare you, at the now terrified boy, and smashes his writing slate over his head. The teacher pushes Anne to the front of the classroom, calls her behavior indecent, and writes on the board, Anne surely has a very bad temper, ordering her to write it a hundred times. Anne glowers at him, turns to the board, and adds the missing final E to her name. Beginning with her attack on her male classmate, it is Anne who is now teaching the class some lessons. She turns physical aggression back upon the boys and far more forcefully. And in a couple of ways, she embodies the tendency of women's humor to reclaim a negative as a positive. She, pushed by her teacher to the front of the room, she takes advantage of her new position at the head of the class, turning her punishment into a sort of graduation. Her classmates are now her audience, as she asserts her authority by correcting her teacher's misspelling of her name. And in doing so within the context of the sentence written on the board, Anne turns the teacher's criticism into an affirmation. Anne surely does have a very bad temper, and anyone who says so better get her name right. <laughs> If you want a contemporary example of this move, recall how Hillary Clinton's supporters turned Trump's criticism of her as a nasty woman into posters and t-shirts, which they displayed proudly and defiantly at rallies. You can see from this example one possible explanation as to why the myth of women's humorlessness persists. A woman using humor can be dangerous to the status quo. If, as Atwood says, Canadian comedy is marked by its provinciality, the ultimate example would be Newfie comedy. Newfoundland embodies all of the greatest extremes about Canada. If Canada is cold, Newfoundland is famously stormy, and coping with unpredictable weather is a daily event. If Canada is large and sparsely populated outside of a few big cities, then Newfoundland is the most distant province with its own time zone. Many critics have noted that humor often develops from oppression and that traditionally oppressed groups, such as Jews and African Americans, have developed particularly rich senses of humor. Gordon Ralph links these groups' social oppression with the Newfies' environmental and economic oppression to account for Newfies' particularly rich sense of humor. One celebrated Newfoundland comedian is Mary Walsh. Best known for her creation of Marg Delahunty, Warrior Princess, a character who specializes in accosting politicians. Marg attires her middle-aged body in a revealing but distinctly unfashionable superhero costume of her own invention. This paradoxical construction is perhaps best shown on her bodice, which reveals a lot of skin, but also features golden spirals covering her breasts. The spiral itself is paradoxical. It centers on her nipple, thus accentuating the revealing nature of her costume, yet the spiral is also a symbol of female energy. The result is a character who is both scantily attired and pushy, bringing together characteristics that possess especially loaded meanings when applied to women. One of the funniest situations that Marg has forced herself into was an encounter uh, with Stephen Harper on the campaign trail. In this infamous scene, she's coaching Harper on how to loosen up and create an accessible, likable public identity. Embrace me. Practice on me. Oh. Not bad. A little cold. 
Marg is breaking out of the stereotype of the sexually passive woman, and we're startled by this. Women get so few opportunities to be in charge of situations that when one comes along, women have to go for it, even when, if the genders were reversed, it would be a case of harassment. The aftermath is that both Marg and Harper are marked by the comic color orange, as was Anne, the redhead. Covered in orange, Harper joins Marg in absurd comic costume. Even more so than Marg, he looks like a clown. Harper doesn't get the male badge of honor of a perfect pink lipstick mark on his collar. On the contrary, he's totally besmooched by her absurd marking. And note that while a prolonged kiss is a sexual act, this one is both ridiculous and subversive. She's not the bombshell we're accustomed to seeing attached to politicians, but Marg the warrior princess has conquered Harper with bright orange lipstick. As Americans, Diana and I see in Mary Walsh's encounter with Harper a benefit of Canada's so-called provincialism, namely the remarkable accessibility of Canadian politicians, and Harper's remarkable good humor in going along with it. There seems to be an opportunity here for comic interplay between politicians and comedian citizens that is largely absent in the US. President Trump loves kissing. <laughs> it's like a magnet, he says. <laughs> Just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. But can you imagine Trump letting Marg Delahunty kiss him? <laughs> or laughing about it afterwards? And indeed, not everyone finds Mary Walsh's act amusing. In a 2015 web video, conservative Canadian activist Ezra Levant attacked Mary Walsh as the prime example of CBC News political favoritism. Throughout, Levant said, says about the worst thing one can say about a comedian, male or female. 12 times in a seven minute clip, which we will spare you from watching, he calls Walsh unfunny. But not only unfunny, and it's Levant's other disparaging remarks about Walsh that really bring gender to our attention. Levant calls Walsh nuts and gross, a screamer with no self-awareness. And after showing a clip of Walsh in full Marg Delahunty regalia, confronting Toronto, former Toronto Mayor, Mayor Rod Ford outside his home, Levant insists that Mary Walsh, the pushy comedian, not Rob Ford, the mayor of Canada's largest city, who also happened to be an incorrigible crack addict, is an inappropriate public figure, <laughs> or as Levant uh, calls her, an angry, deranged, has-been hack doing a political hit job. Levant is saying not just that Walsh is unfunny, but that there's something wrong with her. She's inappropriate, she's out of control, she is, to use a very gendered word, hysterical. It's a wonderfully useful word for thinking about the intersection of comedy and gender stereotypes. For hysterical is simultaneously what patriarchal stereotypes insist women cannot help but be emotionally unstable, and what they must not or cannot be hysterically funny. Levant wants us to see that Walsh's violations of feminine physical and behavioral norms, even or especially in the name of comedy, are repulsive. But we celebrate Walsh and refuse to see it that way. The character of Marg Delahunty embodies both Canadian women's humor and the problems female comedians continue to face. Here's to the next 150 years of Canadian culture containing many fewer Levants and many more Margs. Thank you. Well, I agree with the last line. Um, thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, introduce Taylor Morphe. Yeah. Come on up. And we've asked Taylor to begin the questions, but then we'll turn them open to uh, you. Okay. okay. 
That was great. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, uh, so I have a couple questions I was thinking about, but here's one of the ones I came up with is, um, it seems like humor has a startling quality to it or an element of surprise or incongruity. Um, and it seems like the way you guys were talking about it, humor has a lot to do with power and the potential to reclaim something or deal with oppression. And so I was wondering um, if it is that surprise or incongruity that sort of allows for that sort of reclamation or something like that. Good question. Thanks. <laughs> Diana would be happy to answer. <laughs> I think that just modeled an answer to your question, yes. right? The surprise factor. Yes. Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, there's there's several different theories of humor. The um, it, the incongruity theory is one of them. Uh, the aggression or um, uh, superiority theory is another, and of course the relief theory is a third. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think that incongruity uh, is a big part of humor, and uh, simply the ability to to surprise. Um, is something that, that takes people aback. I think the, the scene with Mar Delahunty accosting Stephen Harper is a great example of that kind of surprise. I mean, what was he supposed to do? Um, he's on the campaign trail, he's in front of the camera, and he's accosted by a woman wearing, you know, as, you know presciently, um, tons and tons of orange lipstick uh, so that he can't help but come away looking like a clown. Um, but certainly, I, I think that Marg uses that element of surprise to great effect um, in, in her dealing with Stephen Harper. There was this, um, the sophists back in, in ancient Greece used to use this teaching technique called the, the disoi logoi, or opposing arguments, where they would, they would encourage their students to come up with convincing arguments on like, like unthinkable propositions. To take, take what everybody believes, and now let's argue forcefully for the opposite. Not necessarily because you actually want to advocate the opposite, but just as a critical thinking strategy, right? And I think comedy can sometimes uh, perform that kind of uh, critical thinking work that the disoi logoi could do in maybe a more appealing and, and pleasant way. Like if you look at, say, Louis C.K., the stand-up comedian, and how much of his comedy is about how awful it is to be a parent, right? How much he just hates parenthood and just what a constant state of, <laughs> what, just what a grind it is, right? And you know, he says something about how he hates when parents say, I just can't imagine my life without children. And he says, are you serious? That's all I imagine. <laughs> right? and, and so that runs completely counter to what we know we're supposed to say about how children are just a joy 24 hours a day. And of course, all parents know they're not. And, so I think humor can sometimes do that, that cultural work of making us like, uh, uh, think the unthinkable. Second question? Oh, sure. Um, so this is another one that I was thinking about. Um, I, and I kind of, I was just thinking <coughs> what happens with humor when it isn't appreciated or when a joke doesn't land, like, like with Marge, when it, when it isn't working for some people. Uh, I was just, I, I have like a sort of a broad question, just like what, what happens when that happens? Like uh, how, how do we look at the humor then in that, in that case? Kind of. The humorists go home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher wants to die in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a good question and, and one I could talk about, I'm sure Diana could too, for a long time, right? But just in the interest of brevity, one thing that comes to mind is where Freud says, uh, and I certainly don't buy all of Freud's theories about humor, or, or about anything for that matter, but he says that to share a laugh can be a moment of, of a complete psychic accord. Mm. And I kind of like that, where if, if you laugh at something together, it shows that you have something in common, and you've established that commonality in a really efficient way. Right? And if you try to use humor and it doesn't go over well, then I guess you could say the opposite has been demonstrated in that moment. There's something right now about us that's, that's really, really different. And now we're both awkwardly aware of that. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, does anyone want to jump into this awkward moment with another question from the audience over here? Yes. I mean, bring this. We, we do want to capture your question for the taping. 
Thank you. I I'm wanted to know about the uh, raging grannies. They often have a costume which itself is a is a comedy, and they sing, make songs as a protest song. What do you think, uh, comedy of uh, grand raging grannies? And my second question is I'm about. Sorry, can you say that again? The comedy of oh, raging, raging granny. granny. Raging grannies. Have you heard? Of I don't no. know it. I'm Jesus. sorry, you. Uh, yeah, you should know by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're right. Okay. All kinds of things <laughs> Go I to the know. YouTube, you'll find it. My second question is there's a lot of First Nation. In fact, we have a, a video in the SFU library about First Nation comedy. And have you seen that or not as well? Uh, you know, First Nations have a lot of jokes and they have even able to people's television network as a show of uh, comedy shows. Uh, what's your experience of that? Um, we're, we're always, uh, <laughs> I always encourage my students to send me comedy links and so I, I learn a lot through them, but I'm glad to know about the existence of this video in our, in our library. Uh, we're, we're always looking for a good laugh. And my last question is, can, what's the borderline between comedy and cynical? Because sometimes you are making, as the last question said, some people don't get it, but then they look at it as a cynical statement. Between comedy so, and, and, and being cynical. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really Thank good you. question. I think to some extent it would be a difference of, of attitude, right? And of, of what you're trying to do with humor. Uh, it, it's, it's a good question. What do, what do you think? Well, I, I make a lot of jokes and so on. But sometimes, uh, as you mentioned, you don't get it. People think I'm making a cynical joke, but I'm, I'm yeah. either protesting or I'm making a joke of a joke. Yeah, cynical or that you're not because taking something seriously. Noah, for example, Noah, the guy who, who replaced John Stewart, he makes a lot of comedy because of his background in Africa and so on. But a lot of people don't get it. And yeah. sometimes dismiss it. Thank you. Another question over here? Actually, it's not really a question. I just thought I'd try to make a bridge with the first question about the raging grannies. It was just a, a, a protest group, right? Mm -hmm. they, it's, aren't they anti-nuclear a lot? Or where yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, so just generally, like, you know, you, there is that phenomenon of protest groups with, you know, clowning and, and elements of humor involved. So. I don't know if you want to comment on thank, that. Thank you, Betty. Sure. I, I think some of the most effective um, protests use comedy in them. In fact, uh, there was a clip that I saw um, uh, about a uh, KKK march that was accompanied by a guy playing the sousaphone next to them. And, he, and so rather than you know, using violence to try to shut down the march, he actually walked next to them and, and um, let out a melody that was Bum, 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 And it was just a wonderful um, use of comedy to, to wage a protest in a completely nonviolent but extremely effective way. I think even more effective because it then got videotaped and shared. So thank you for making that bridge. And I, I think you know, when we look at you know, the, um, uh, the proliferating protest marches that are taking place these days all over North America, often the pictures that make it into um, the, the newspapers and onto people's um, websites and Facebook feeds are the pictures of really funny signs. Um, uh, so it, it's wonderful to collect that and to see comedy in this, in this political, um, you know, making a political statement this way. Thank you. Yes, question right here. Oh, wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Here you go. I'm picking up on Atwood's point about Canadian comedy being provincial, which makes sense. Um, but I also wonder, you know, when I think about uh, Canadian comedians, especially in the last 20 years or so, there's a real element of satire. Mm -hmm. And it's very political. Rick Mercer, Samantha Bee, oh. Kids in the Hall. Uh, Baroness von Sketch, um, all the this hour is 22 minutes stuff that's been going on lately. Um, do you see any kind of an intersection between provincialism and the urge to satire? 
Yeah, I think uh, in the sense that to be provincial is, uh, is another way to be a type of outsider, right? Um, and either to, either to feel like an outsider and or to be deemed an outsider by people who deem themselves to be the insiders. So in that sense, provincialism could stand alongside, I guess, race, class, and, and gender as certain kinds of identity that encourage satirical humor against the, the mainstream. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, it's a convenient post to take, too, if you want to make a satiric point, is to put yourself in the voice of the, of the provincial um, you know, common sense, well, what do I know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, yeah. there's that too, yeah. right. Right, yeah. and if yeah. we think of, you know, um, classic definitions of satire as implying a very select audience, the satirist is, is interested in, in writing for, you know, a small coterie of sympathetic others, uh, then we can see that happening in provincial um, type, um, uh, communities. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I don't, I just, I don't think audience. most of the Canadian satire right now is actually that narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kids in the Hall have been going for like 25 years or something. Not Kids in the Hall, sorry. Um, this hour is 22 minutes. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, um, and Rick Mercer is not particularly narrowly focused either. Another comment, please. Well, it's actually a question this time, but it's 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 a it's an easy small question to answer. Is do you think comedy changes anything? <laughs> That's a big question. I, oh, is that? Oh, I hadn't realized that. <laughs> Deceptively short and small. Deceptively. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was talking to somebody recently about different kinds of protest and some criticisms I, I had about uh, some strategies of contemporary activism and protest and I was pointing out the use of humor in, in protest as an alternative. And, and he raised a good point which is, well, how do you actually know that humor is more effective than these other strategies mm -hmm. and not just one that you find more appealing? Uh, and it was a great question in that I don't think I really had a good answer. Uh, but I think one possible answer would be what, what you were saying about how people like humor. So if, if part of making a message effective is getting it widely broadcast, then something like the, the sousaphone at the KKK march will probably get more, uh, more attention than somebody earnestly holding up a protest sign at, at, the same, at the same protest. Now whether that attention translates into change in action, I don't know that I can generalize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think it's one, um, one way to certainly get the message out, um, and in that case can be very effective. Um, whether it's more effective than other strategies, um, I don't know, but it, it's certainly one that, um, that, uh, that gets picked up on and, and that I think is appealing to many. Any other comments over here? Excellent. Okay, Taylor. Over here. Thank you. I kind of going off of that. You mentioned something before about the wit and sort of how that has like an appealing cleverness to it, and I wonder if that in these protests has something to do with its appeal, or if, um, or, or if that interacts with any idea of change or not change, depending on sort of how that cleverness is uh, appreciated by its audience or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is kind of my question. Which was <laughs> You want to take a step? Um, on that one? Sure. I, you know, when you said that, I just flashed back to a um, uh, a, uh, a pro-choice march that I went to um, way back in the late '80s um, in in Washington, um, and and I guess the the fact that I still remember this sign, I think, speaks to your point. I remember being struck by a woman carrying a, sh a sign with a picture of a church steeple on it. Um, uh, with a pair of, of legs spread over it, saying, keep your church out of my crotch. <laughs> and, you know, whether that's the wittiest sign or not, uh, it's certainly something that I had never encountered before and that I still remember to this day. And so it was a wonderful combination of, you know, the graphic and the wonderful saying. 
Uh, but that there is, I think that comedy creates memory. Um, it, it's one of the great ironies that so many people um, have trouble remembering jokes, and yet that you that these moments of of comedy uh, can come back to us at you know at the most striking moments. You know that that they are so vivid. Um, so that I, I think that um, that those moments of wit and um, you know and here you know associated with protest can be very effective um, both in getting the message out but also in staying with us. Are clowns comedians? Clowns in the circle, because children are always laughing and wonder. Are, are clowns comedians? <laughs> My kids think they're terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> they hate clowns. Yeah, I, I, I think I know more people who are afraid of clowns, um, actually, than uh, who would find them comic, but, but some people find them entertaining. Comedy, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, some jokes are funny to some people and not to others, and I guess I would put clowns in, in that category as appealing to some and certainly you know, strongly not to others. Thank you. I have a question over here. So um, I'm always struck by Canada's um, need to cry out its existence, like uh, we did that, or you think of like the Canada arm on the space shuttle, <laughs> and the very fact that it's called the Canada arm, which of course no one knows on, except Canadians. Um, but, um, but one way in which Canadians seem to be way too modest is in comedy. Mm -hmm. You think of the disproportionate number of uh, Im important and um, famous comedians in the US who are not American, but no Americans know that. Um, so I don't even know if I have a question. I actually had 10 questions before I picked up the microphone uh, to ask this question, and they've all gone. But I guess my, my I'm wondering why, if, I don't know, maybe it's not true, but it seems to me it's true. Do you have any um, sense of why that might be, this way in which Canada does dominate US culture, but tends not to talk about it? And dominates, uh, to go back to something Rhonda was talking about, dominates satire of American culture, yeah. right? Uh, which is more important now than ever. Um, yeah, I was thinking about your term a minute ago about the provincialism, like it's another, yeah. it's another form of provinciality that gives them power. Yeah. Or else power, I should say. Uh, God, I don't know. Maybe that's the fault of us Americans more than anything else. Of, 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 of course, you know, like comedians who have a. Um, Comics who've got some sort of professional drive want to make it in the states, right? And once they're they're kind of claimed as claimed as, as the U.S.'s own, or they or they stop signaling their their Canadianness. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's it. Sean right. and I, it has to be said, we were a little self-conscious when we were invited to talk about 150 years of Canadian <laughs> women's comedy, given that we both grew up in the US. Um, but I can talk about my own, just in brief answer to your question, my own process of moving to Canada 10 years ago and suddenly learning that so much of you know, the, the comedians, so many of the comedians um, who I you know, loved in U.S. culture were actually Canadian, and that part of my transition to moving to Canada was to learn exactly what in uh, the culture of comedy and in pop culture in the U.S. actually came from Canada. Right. Like this was really important to learn music groups and. Uh, uh, I was seriously, I was schooled by a friend of mine's boyfriend who uh, was from Ontario, and he was quizzing me about Cowboy Junkies and Rush and Brian Adams and all these people who I just Lover never boy. Was Lover boy. Lover <laughs> boy. <laughs> it wasn't on my radar <laughs> um, as an American. So I, I was, you know, the typical ignorant American in so many ways. Um, so I think Sean's point is, is certainly valid that um, the Canadian comedians want to make it big and want to affect um, the U.S. as well as Canadian culture, and maybe that's how. Although I think Rhonda has I, a very I think important. Who want, and we have a lot of famous comedians in Canada who have not tried to. Vote it's the true. States. It's <laughs> certainly true. I don't think Rick Mercer would work in the states. <laughs> 
That's true. And I also certainly hadn't heard of Rick Mercer you know, when I was living yeah. in the States either. We have time for one last question. It's not a question, it's an observation. I actually had a conversation about this way back in 2002 when I was living in Ireland. Uh, and in, you have a, a huge number of Irish comedians who a lot of them go to England. And we were talking about this, the same sort of thing. Well, I have all these Canadians. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if you're a, a small country beside a big cultural powerhouse mm -hmm. and you're getting all their media inundating you all the time. And you know, we grew up with mainly, you know, American shows, uh, that you're in this interesting position. I'm not that, right? And I don't want to be that necessarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but standing here, I've got a good view of that. And uh, it's a good position from which to launch the critiques and launch the satire and have the fun. And then if they'll pay me more, I'll cross the border. No, basically. Wonderful, one last comment. Uh, just, just quickly, I want to speak to the educational value of comedy. Uh, I, I also had that experience of moving to Canada and trying to figure out what it is about. And a couple of years after I moved, I wound up in an office with a whole bunch of Canadians. And we would watch 22 Minutes over lunch. Mm. And I think I learned more about Canada, <laughs> about provincial differences, about current politics, about what mattered, more from 22 Minutes than you know the history books and the magazines that I had tried to read before. Um, and I think that's, that's the kinds of things that people don't talk about unless it's in a, in a funny context. They, they don't talk about how you know, there are prejudices across provinces and certain groups and so on. So, so and uh, in this context of Canada 150, I think comedy has great educational value. <laughs> Thank you. Well, some of them just didn't get yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, they would educate, yeah, okay, this is yeah. why. <laughs> Well, please join me in thanking our, our wonderful speakers.